Good afternoon and welcome to AIADA's Auto Talk series. Auto Talks are held every third Tuesday of the month. I am Dan Barson, your host for today's program. Before I introduce today's presenter, let me review a few administrative issues. First of all, everyone on the call today will get a uh, copy uh, of today's presentation that you're about to see. Also, if you have any questions during the, the uh, session, please feel free to enter them in the bottom right corner of your screen under the Q&A. So please feel free and address or, or send us over your questions, and we'll try to address uh, as many of those and get those answered for you prior to the uh, close of today's programming. Please remain on the line for upcoming program announcements and some items uh, about NADA and some of the programming that will be available at uh, the upcoming NADA convention. And with that, let me introduce Laramie Sandquist. Laramie is General Manager, Risk Management Resources for Federated Insurance. Laramie was with us a few months ago, if you recall, when we did cybersecurity, and we're really proud to have him back. Laramie, welcome back to the program. All right, thank you, Dan, and thank you for this opportunity again. Uh, as, as a partner with AIADA for over 20 years now, uh, Federated has a has a great history, and, and obviously we're out there trying to protect dealers and dealer interests as much as we can. And so that's what this presentation is all about. Uh, is your dealership one share, send, or like away from disaster? And what we're really going to focus on is the non-traditional employment risks that are out there, non-traditional things that uh, may be popping up that uh, maybe your traditional employment practices haven't kept up on. Because uh, social media, social communication, mobile device usage in the workplace, uh, that's all exploded now here in the last probably five years or so. And sometimes these, uh, these new technologies get in front of our employment policies and how we, how we manage these uh, potential issues that are out there. So uh, we're not, all, we're not naive to think that technology isn't going to continue to advance, so keeping on top of this technology area is, is definitely uh, uh, something we all need to be doing because, unfortunately, at the time of claim, ignorance doesn't really go that far, uh, and the courts and the, and the juries are definitely held, holding us accountable to being on top of some of this stuff. So, so we'll take a look at some of the main issues, some of the main areas that we're seeing. Um, some new and emerging risks from, uh, from a technological standpoint, and then just some ideas on what businesses can do about it. So we'll talk a little bit about phone use. We'll talk a little bit about um, texting. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some traditional employment risks. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about taking photos and, and things that go on there, inappropriate photos potentially even. Uh, and then your traditional uh, harassment and discrimination things that uh, we've probably talked about in the past, postings on social media, and then kind of similar to what a previous presentation was on was uh, cyber harassment or, or cyber liability that's out there. So let's we'll start it off by going through electronic device use. And really, does the company look at uh, how these electronic devices are being used in the workplace? So we know there are all types of different devices that are out there, whether it be a traditional uh, PC type unit, whether it be more of an iPad type uh, unit that folks are using, uh, whether that be on the sales floor or back in the service area, or uh, some folks are using their, their own iPhones or uh, you know your mobile device from that standpoint. But really, is the company looking at that saying, what is this uh, property, electronic property that we own? And how are employees and officers and everyone within the organiz organization supposed to use these? Um, so a traditional policy may just discuss what is the property itself. So say it is a, a tablet, as we see here in this picture. Uh, but what is the recommended usage for that tablet? How are employees supposed to use it? And what are best practices? Um, because in the end, uh, these are company assets, very similar to any other, any other company asset you have, and employees need to be treating it that way. And if they don't treat it correctly, uh, you need to be taking action based on that. Uh, another thing to be thinking about is personal usage of these devices, okay. Um, how often can they use it for person, personal use? When can they use it for personal use? Um, and looking at those pieces, um, because that can, that can come into play as well. You don't want people... Uh, 
you know, downloading certain applications on these devices, so whether that's a company-provided phone or, or a tablet-type device, or you don't want them um, surfing on certain sites uh, that, that may not uh, be appropriate for business purposes, so whether that be social media sites or maybe even YouTube sites or, or just general um, uh, websites that are out there that uh, people may go to. Uh, personal accountability and harassment. Uh, we've seen these devices being used, uh, sometimes inappropriately, and so a policy would just uh, state something similar to, you may not use the company's computers to post, store, transmit, download, or distribute any of the following, which may be threatening materials, uh, maliciously false materials, obscene materials, uh, competitor information that may or may not be true, or anything consti constituting or encouraging a criminal offense or giving any liability back to the company. So we've seen some of this stuff play out where uh, uh, people will respond back to different uh, chain letters or put out personal broadcast messages or, or uh, even be sending out material that may be copywritten uh, and the, uh, the dealership doesn't have um, the rights to be able to distribute that information. So um, we've seen uh, salespeople uh, be in the business of having their own personal uh, Facebook sites that they will encourage their customers to go visit where they'll put information out there and that information may or may not be uh, uh, good information to have out there from a dealership standpoint. So if that's happening, are, how are you controlling your employees' use of uh, these social media sites, these electronic devices? Then the last piece is business trade secrets. Um, we've seen some of these pieces as well where uh, in the event of an employment separation, the employee does have access to these business trade secrets and uh, how are those trade secrets being protected? Uh, because if those are kept on a personal device, so say they have their own uh, cellular, cellular phone or smartphone that they're using for business purposes, they may have some trade secrets. So that could include customer lists, that could include uh, personally identifiable information about that customer or maybe even other business trade secrets that you have. Obviously, there's a uh, reason why you're different from your competitors and your employees will know that, but are they able to transfer that to a to a new employer? So. Things to, all things to think about as you're looking at electronic device usage in your, in your business and who's going to own that uh, because we know some dealers out there are owning everything. So they, they own the phone, they own the, the tablet device, they, they own the laptops and they allow the employees to use them. And then if there's a separation, the employee just returns that back to the dealership. But we also know of some that have uh, instituted uh, bring your own device policies where they would have uh, the employee provide the device and they would just download software or give them the uh, yeah the software needed to do their job so um, things to think about as you're as you're putting together your strategy on how to use these electronic devices and if you haven't thought about it uh, you can probably be rest assured that some of your savvy um, sales folks or techs technicians have already been doing it and maybe unbeknownst to you, uh, some of this stuff may be even going on in your dealership that you don't even know about. So some claims examples that we've seen uh, with electronic device use is um, a lot of them re revolve around employees using personal devices or, or, elect or uh, company provided devices for inappropriate uses. So a lot of it gets into uh, sharing of pictures and videos and, and uh, you know, whenever you get into years like this where it's election, election year, uh, they'll share some, you know, political stuff that's out there and things like that where uh, may not be appropriate for the workplace and they're using um, uh, company resources to, to do that. And, you know, it's, uh, you can't monitor everything that goes on out there, but you can look to have policies in place to prevent that. And if you do hear about it, uh, and are made aware of it, then you can take personal, you know, personnel action based on that. And then we've also had ones where employees would, tra would steal trade secrets. They'd steal customer lists, they'd steal information about that business and, and uh, go work for a competitor and take that with them. And the dealership has to go back and, and try to get those resources back. And uh, we've, we've seen too where employees will try to uh, uh, sue dealers for retaliation on that point. Um, so just making sure that you're laying out ahead of time what the trade secrets are and who owns the rights to those trade secrets, to those customer lists, to things like that. Um, just making sure that you're, you're uh, keeping on top of that piece is important. So, um, the next piece is, is getting into uh, taking photos. And 
Uh, we do uh, see some dealerships taking photos and using those for advertising purposes, which is uh, which are all good things. But uh, the biggest thing is making sure that the photos are appropriate and there's a business purpose for taking those photos. And what are we doing with them? Uh, so is it a corporate or is it a personal photo? Is it uh, a corporate or personal device? And then is there any confidential information or, or a confidential company or customer information being shared? So um, one of the claims examples we've seen um, in this area is an employee takes a picture with a customer in their new vehicle. Um, yeah, that's probably pretty standard out there. And, and the, they share it with the customer themselves, uh, maybe give them a, uh, a stock picture of it, a uh, paper picture or whatever, or they may just email them the picture uh, so they can have it electronically. But then they may also use that picture on their personal Facebook page or you know whatever they're using as their promotional page. And anytime they start using someone else's uh, picture without their permission, uh, it, it does run into a, some potential issues of uh, infringement on that person's rights and, and using that uh, that photo for uh, business gain. So we have had some some issues with that where they've uh, they've wanted people to take those photos down off of their internet page or their uh, their Facebook page or what have you. So so basically uh, just monitoring the photos um, and these should all be for business purposes. And if you are, are monitoring the electronic devices, uh, so say they're all company owned and they're all tablets or maybe even they're all phones, uh, making sure that uh, you're keeping tabs on those and usually your central administrator can be looking at those to make sure um, that there aren't any inappropriate photos and everything's being, everything's being used uh, the way you would expect it to be used within your business. Because the next one is the inappropriate photos um, and, and kind of the horseplay and things like that. Um, these should just be prohibited and include, uh, include something in a code of conduct or somewhere else in your employee handbook to address this because uh, specific photos may not cause you the issue, but what they could potentially cause you is the uh, a cultural issue, uh, an issue where um, someone comes back after uh, after having an employment relationship with you and and says, you know, this is just a very uh, intimidating, harassing work for, workplace, and I can't cite one thing specifically, but I want you to look through their through their uh, electronic devices. I mean, look at some of the photos they take. Look at some of the things that they do. They document all this stuff. They take videos of it, and it's just crazy some of the things that go on. And and we've had claims like that where someone will claim like a unlawful termination, but then they'll come back and say, well, yeah, they've got all this other stuff that they do. So sometimes these videos and photos and, and just what I'll call just random horseplay stuff that gets uh, documented through electronic means can cause you some problems down the line because it, it creates more of a, a cultural thing that an attorney can kind of grab onto to say, yeah, this stuff does go on in that dealership. And uh, I attend a lot of seminars and, and presented a lot of seminars, and, and one that I, that I remember vividly was about a year and a half ago, I listened to an attorney's, attorney talk, and he basically said, attorneys are storytellers. And if you as the business don't fill in the chapters of the book, they'll do it. The attorneys will do it, and they'll backfill that book with their information, not your information. And ultimately, he challenged everyone in the room to say, whose story do you want them to tell? Do you want them to tell your story, or do you want them to tell their story? And obviously the attorney's story is going to be slanted in the favor of the person they're representing. So you want to be able to tell your story. So that gets us into media relations and some other things that uh, are out there. Uh, social media itself is, is a big one. Um, a lot of different channels are being used nowadays and uh, they may be used from a corporate standpoint or they may be used from an individual standpoint. And a lot of uh, a lot of salespeople are very uh, creative in their uses of these uh, for all good reasons, for all good intent and purpose. But the business needs to be on top of this to understand how this is being used and if it's being used appropriately. So the other thing that comes into to play with social media is uh, the National Labor Relations Act. There's a section seven of the, under the National Labor Relations Act that does allow people to communicate via social media uh, and uh, be able to talk about various things, so various things about their employment. Maybe they can go out there and post on their Facebook wall that their boss is a jerk for whatever reason, or they don't like having to do a certain piece of their job, or you know whatever it happens to be. And this is all protected speech uh, under that Section 7 Act, so we have to be careful too is how we not only monitor social media, but then also how we um, uh, retaliate against employees or uh, 
you know, performance manage employees based off of how they use these social media pieces. So you got two different aspects. You got the business use of social media, and then you got the personal use of social media. The business use you can control, the personal use sometimes you can't. You have to look at that as potentially water cooler talk and just basic uh, employee chatter. So there is some protections out there from the National Labor, Rel National Labor Relations Act. But from a business standpoint, those social media guidelines um, should add value to the company. I mean, if someone is using social media, um, specifically, hopefully it's uh, you know controlled by the business itself, it should add value to the business. Um, the displaying of corporate assets, whether that be uh, corporate plans, corporate training plans, corporate uh, initiatives, anything that could be considered confidential to the business uh, should obviously be outlawed uh, as far as being able to share and show on social media. So even if it's on someone's personal site, they, they would not be able to uh, uh, do that on their personal site and have protection under that National, Rela National Labor Relations Act. Um, advertising. Uh, making sure that all advertising is um, used in, in line with what your corporate ad advertising guidelines are. You don't want one person advertising things one way and another person advertising another way and then your, then your main website advertising it a different way. So, because that gets us into record keeping, is anything that uh, is displayed out there in social media or on your website, you're probably going to want to keep a record of. Um, so that if a, a customer comes back and says, well, wait a minute, you displayed that vehicle for you know, fifteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars, and now you're trying to charge me seventeen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. Um, you would have a record of what's going on uh, from a uh, uh, advertising standpoint of, of various things. So, it's it's prudent to to stay on top of that. And then ultimately, these uh, these channels should just be respectful. In general, they should be respectful. They are business channels, and they shouldn't be used as other channels to uh, get other messages across. The, 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 the business should definitely be protecting that channel from an advertising standpoint. And that gets into that corporate communications. Any media, any government agencies, or any other outside parties that may have questions or things about your business, um, it should be directed to an individual or individuals in the organization. You shouldn't have um, your frontline salespeople or service managers or people like that answering questions from the media or any other uh, government agency or someone else that may come through your dealership looking for uh, quotes or whatever they may be looking for. So just keeping that in mind that media relations uh, can, can lead to some pretty interesting uh, sticky situations that uh, <clears throat> get made even worse by some of the, uh, you know, the employee rights that are out there. The next piece is the uh, data compromise and cyber risk. Uh, we, we talked about this in a previous webinar, so this is more of an update, but uh, just making sure all these uh, networks are secure. Uh, and how is the employee able to access uh, various information within your network? So do they have access to uh, all the customer lists, or do they have access just to their customer list? Do they have access to personally identifiable information, or is that just in your finance department? Um, so who has access to what? And then the bigger thing is, how are they communicating with customers? Um, are they communicating through their own email channels, or are they communicating through a corporate email channel? So say they may be using a, a Gmail or a Yahoo account or something like that uh, for their personal use, and then they start using that same email for customer interactions. Well, now you may expose yourself to um, potentially giving out information or secure information over an unsecure network. So you want to be looking into that on, you know, making sure that employees are, are using the appropriate channels when communicating uh, information to customers. Make sure that those channels are secure because a lot of those outside uh, email servers are not secure servers. So just keep that in mind. And then, uh, yeah, ultimately, customer information is the biggest thing here of making sure that that personally identifiable information does not get into the wrong hands. So keeping that stuff in mind. Um, and then the traditional piece of this, um, bring up harassment and discrimination. This is by far one of the growing areas of, uh, of risk that we're seeing from a, a covered coverage line standpoint in insurance. Uh, we're seeing way too many claims, and it encompasses everything we've been talking about today because I say that the rules are still the same. The same rules apply. It's just different how, how people are doing it. So now instead of uh, 
going up and, and talking to someone and being harassing or discriminating, now we're doing it through social media or we're doing it through texting or we're doing it through emails or we're doing it through some other, uh, you know, photo taking or photo bombing or, you know, all kinds of things like that. And so it, it just it just changes the dynamic. And if we're not staying on top of that with our employment practices and we're not staying on top of that with our communication with employees that, hey, you can't do this stuff, um, then we may have uh, some issues to deal with. So I put on their electronic communication is forever. And uh, I talk to our claims folks quite regularly on these and they say, you know, the, the worst thing, they say, you know, harassment discrimination was always bad in the past but it's even worse today because the evidence is right there. <laughs> that text message is right there. That picture is right there. That email or that communication piece is right there. You can't deny that it happened. It's there. Um, so that's that's huge from, uh, from a, a game changer. And employees need to know that. They need to know that hey, anything you can and can do and do do on these electronic devices you better feel comfortable having someone read that back to you in the court of law or having someone read that back to you in front of your family or your friends because it can and will get used against you at some point. So um, then the last piece, re retaliation is, is uh, by far the fastest growing EEOC claim area, so the Equal Opportunity em uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, they, they look at a lot of different things from intimidation, uh, promotion, demotion, loss of merit, hostile work environment, all kinds of things um, that uh, are retaliatory in the workplace. So uh, we've seen some of these claims. These generally revolve around um, some kind of uh, relationship gone sour. So let's say manager hires employee, manager and employee uh, start having a uh, relationship outside of work, but it spills over into the workplace and that relationship goes sour. and employee ends up getting fired for performance, but the employee comes back and says, wait a minute, uh, my performance really hasn't changed. I've always been a poor performer, and now all of a sudden, since our relationship went sour, now you're getting rid of me. So uh, they call that a retaliation piece, and sometimes they'll throw some other things in there as well as far as uh, protected class type areas. But the biggest thing is, is, is make sure that we're monitoring that, monitoring the retaliation piece, and we're getting all sides of the story before making employment decisions. Uh, those end up you know, those end up unfortunately being the bigger ones because uh, there is a lot of you know, a lot of stuff going on with those type claims that um, that make them make them uh, ultimately very tricky. So where do we start um, and how do we how do we put together some best practices? And I say it starts at the beginning. It starts with your hiring practices. Um, is that employee that you're hiring a good fit for your organization? Do they, uh, do they bring out the, the best of themselves and do they bring out the best of your business and do you trust them? Do you trust them to do the job and be a good representative of your business? Um, that's first and foremost. Um, and I know it's tough to hire good people nowadays, but you can't, you can't mess up on this piece of it. You have to hire the right way because your culture is dependent on it. Uh, those people are the, are the face of your business when it's all said and done. But then once, it's, once you get them in there, uh, you really want to look at your current culture. Look at your employment policies. Look at your code of conduct. Look at your harassment, your discrimination, your driving policies, your safety programs, your employee handbooks, all these things, and make sure that they still represent who you are and what you want people to do. Because ultimately, these are going to be the documents that are going to save you in the event of having to make those employment separation decisions and having to defend yourself. Um, so these are these have to be kept up to date with the changing dynamics of different things that are out there. So whether that be electronic devices, whether that be social media, whether that be other employee employment communications, these policies have to reflect that. And uh, ultimately, leaving uh, kind of that code of conduct open to interpretation, but also you know by having it say something to the effect of that you know we. We strive to have all employees act in accordance with the highest standards of personal and professional integrity, comply with all laws, comply with all rules, comply with all regulations, and anyone who violates that could be subject to disciplinary action up to and including termination. So it's really getting down to uh, the nitty gritty of do our policies or have our policies kept up with um, the changing times. Um, and we, uh, we partner with an outside uh, legal group called Inquiron who actually uh, does webinars uh, for us as well. And one of the big things that they, they recommend to people is 
uh, getting your employment policies and your handbooks up to date. Uh, a lot of businesses uh, maybe haven't looked at these for five to ten years, and the employment law world has changed so much. It changes so much an, on an annual basis, let alone in five or ten years. And just the way employees are, are using and doing their jobs today is totally different than the way the job was done five years ago. So your policies need to keep up with that in order to be able to hold them accountable for doing it the right way. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about confidential information. Um, this is becoming a bigger and bigger piece. I talked a little bit about um, the, the cyber piece, but uh, we're seeing it all over where this personally identifiable information has to be done through secure channels. So uh, if you are transmitting uh, credit apps or any other type of information that has uh, customer uh, personally identifiable data on it, it has to be done through secure, secure communication. I can't stress that enough. And then the last piece is that business trade secrets. Um, I, I touched on that a little bit already, but making sure that you're protecting those business trade secrets and employees aren't able to take those with them uh, in the event of a separation of employment. So, and finally, um, just have them acknowledge. Have the employees acknowledge that they understand what the policies are, they understand the new handbook, they understand the new uh, social media policies, they understand the new um, everything that you may be putting in place um, and so that you have that, uh, that, that sign off and that recognition that they understand what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, in the event you have to actually enforce that policy, you know that they've um, you know, signed off and, and understand that they could be held accountable for doing things adverse to what the company is doing. So, so that's that's really uh, the extent of it. And you know, in about 20 minutes, we we don't get a lot of time to go too in depth. But uh, hopefully, we hit on some of the non-traditional things that are going on out there and give you a better idea of some things to at least be thinking about. Because um, I know a lot of dealers have a lot of great things in place. We go out and see dealers every day and talk about employment practices and policies and things like that. And, and most are doing a very, very good job. But it's just some of these uh, some of these new and emerging things that kind of slip, slip through the cracks, and uh, they don't. Uh, they don't, you know, you're just not keeping up on on some of the newer the newer risks that are out there. So, at this point, Dan, I think I'll uh, I think I'll open it up to some questions. I see a couple have come through, and uh, one of them was, do you have a template or standard social media policy? Uh, that one gets a little dicey um, because um, social media policies in general are are more more guidelines than policies. Um, the policy itself um, should re represent how the business uses social media, but maybe not how the person can use social media. Because what you want to do is control your business interests, but you can't have a policy that says that the employee can't use social media to talk about business. <laughs> um, and so, um, so you want to look into that one a little closer. So we know we do not have a standard template for that, but uh, the outside group that we partner with, Inquire On, they do customize policies on social media. And so that is one that uh, we would contact uh, that outside group to work on. Or if you have a, you know, a uh, specific attorney or attorney group that you work with on employment practices, that one gets a little, a little dicey because you do have to be uh, mindful of the that Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. And some of the some of the things that come into play from that standpoint. Um, some other questions: uh, How do we handle personal devices that we don't have control over? Can we re can we require employees to uh, check their devices in with us at the end of the day? Um, if it's their personal device, then no, you can't do that. It's their personal device. Uh, but what you can do is have policies in place, uh, similar to a code of conduct that that regulates or stipulates how they should be using uh, business assets. So if they are using their personal device for business purposes and they're using it um, uh, non-traditionally or not the way that the business would want it to be used, then you can take action on that and you can, um, you can use that as a, a reason to uh, you know, uh, uh, have a discussion with that employee or, or whatever it meant to be. You know, if it's totally egregious, you can probably use that as a as reason to uh, terminate at that point. But uh, to, have a, to have a regular check-in of uh, personal devices, um, no, you can't do that. But you can uh, obviously take action when you're, when you're told of things that happen out there. Um, then another question that actually came through this morning's session was, how much do these uh, types of claims actually cost in general? And what are the biggest reasons they happen? Um, the average claim cost that we see is generally about thirty to 35000 
but that really depends on where you are too because different areas of the country are definitely lower and different areas and other areas of the country are definitely higher than that. So that gives you an idea across the board, but uh, we've seen claims uh, upwards of 500,000 and some even in the millions. Uh, those are very, very egregious type claims that there's really no defense to. Um, so what are the biggest reasons they happen? The biggest reasons they happen is because a, a business has a poor culture. A business does not control what they can control, and that being the hiring practices, that being the code of conduct, the employee handbook, the personnel um, interactions that are going on. Uh, basically, as our claims people say, they have a very loose environment, and everything goes, and there's not a lot of defense to that. And it's not saying that you have to totally, uh, totally constrain everything you're doing, but it does mean that you, you want to be able to make sure that you're, you're controlling what you can control and make sure that you're protecting your brand, you're protecting your business, and you're protecting everything that you've put into this to make it as successful and as vibrant as it is today. And that's, that's ultimately our goal. That's what we try to do with every one of our businesses is get them to think beyond that, that every interaction that you have with customers, whether it be face-to-face -face or through some social media or through texting or whatever it happens to be, that, that's your brand. That's your brand out there every single day. And that can, uh, that can make or break you. And there's been, unfortunately, too many, too many episodes of businesses having to retract things and, and, and back things up because of one bad employee or one bad act that goes on out there. So, so the more that you can control it through policies and training and employee understanding, uh, the better off you are because sometimes employees come with, uh, come with some prerequisites in their mind of how they want to do things. And you've got to, uh, you got to maybe change their, <laughs> change their uh, mindset as they come in new to your dealership because that may be different than what they've previously learned. So with that, Dan, I don't, I don't see any more questions and I may pass it back over to you. Okay, great, Laramie. Thank you so much for uh, the great information this afternoon. If any of you on today's call are attending NADA convention, please stop by Federated's booth. It's number 644C. Uh, to talk with Laramie, he'll be there, and uh, a lot of other uh, federated folks that really are experts in this arena. Uh, let me remind everybody also that Federated is going to have a follow-up to this program on March the 29th at 2 p.m. We'll be sending some information uh, out on that on mobile devices, risk, and solutions, and that'll be a WebEx an hour long. Uh, sponsored by Federated. They're also going to be putting on a Risk Academy May 23rd through the 25th. That is an outstanding program, free of charge, space, uh, as long as space is available. If anybody has any interest in both of those uh, programs, please let us know here and we'll help you get in contact with the folks at Federated. Our next Auto Talk will be April the 19th. It's called called Recall Madness, and it's going to be put on by Rich Sox of Bass Sox Mercer, and it will address the frequency, the increasing frequency and volume of recalls and what the implications are for dealers, what their obligations are, the difference between new and used vehicles, uh, the stop uh, sale recall rulings. Uh, how those differ between new and used, protecting your dealership uh, from customer expectations. So this is really going to be a, di a dynamic session that will be uh, at, at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Put that on your calendar now. Again, April the 19th. Uh, we also hope to see you at NADA. If you're uh, planning on attending NADA convention in Vegas uh, this spring, please make sure and please make plans to attend AIADA's annual membership luncheon. That'll be on uh, April the 3rd on Sunday at the Westgate Hotel, which is attached right to the convention center. It's very convenient. We look forward to seeing you there. Please come by. We'd love to have you. Uh, thanks so much for attending today. Have a great remainder of the week. Good selling. And please feel free, provide us any feedback, any comments. Feel free to send those to me at Barson D, B A R S O N D, at A I A D A dot org. Thanks a lot. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.